every day, every time I read, it's like I, I can't, I cannot believe how much I haven't seen in Scripture. Every time, it's like, I, it's like, huh? I, I read that a million times. I never saw it that way, or I never saw that, or you know, some element always pops out of the out of the pages for me, which is so cool. And then there's uh, another thing that happens where it's like, I'm old enough now, Todd, where I just forgot all about that. You know, it's like, it, it's so it's so incredible. It's like, I'll get these flashbacks to seminary professors or Bible study professors or some sermon I heard like uh, about 10,000 years ago. And it's like, wow, I cannot believe that that slipped out of my mind. I'm so glad to have recaptured that idea. Yep. And so I get the, the benefit of both. That's the, that's the nice thing of living a while. You know, you get the benefit of the chance to still see new things and to relearn some old things. And, and <laughs> kind of exciting. Yeah, the difficult point, Mark, is that when you get that crossover where you think it's new, but it's really not. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is awesome. For the first time I saw, no, you saw that again last week. Yeah, that's... <laughs> Yeah, that takes a little of the fun out of this whole story, right? today with an overview from the Bible Project. I didn't look at uh, at the Bible Project overview, but I did notice, uh, Todd, and I, and I glanced at a couple of the other ones, that there's another uh, Bible Project that came out called the Torah Project, and there's two elements from uh, the Exodus. So I'll, I'll take a look at that, uh, and we'll probably incorporate a few uh, Bible Project elements in. I was really glad to see though that the Bible project had divided it into one through 18 and then 19 through 40. Cause that's always how I've thought of the book is it's kind of two, two essential uh, segments uh, where you've got uh, really the, the, the problem of being in, in, in uh, inside of captivity and, uh, and the exodus from captivity and then Kind of how God is going to orient His people and, and establish Himself in in relationship to His people in the second part, and so that's always uh, how I've thought of it. And I like that they broke it up that way because that way my mind doesn't need to do new gymnastics. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll start with an overview from uh, the the Bible Project, and uh, today we'll look at uh, their their uh, interpretation of how to see. 1 through 18, chapters 1 through 18. So let's get rolling. The book of Exodus. It's the second book of the Bible, and it picks up the storyline from the previous book, Genesis, which ended with Abraham's grandson, Jacob, leading his large family of 70 people down to Egypt. Now, Jacob's 11th son, Joseph, had been elevated to second in command over Egypt, and he had saved his whole family in a famine. And so Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, offered the family to come live there as a safe haven. And so eventually Jacob dies there in Egypt, and Joseph and all his brothers do too. About 400 years pass, and the story of the Exodus begins. Now, that name refers to the event that takes place in the first half of the book, Israel's Exodus from Egypt. But the book has a second half that takes place at the foot of Mount Sinai. In this video, we'll just focus on the first half, where centuries have passed, and the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied, and they filled the land. Now, this line is a deliberate echo back to the blessing that God gave all humanity back in the Garden of Eden. And it reminds us of the big biblical story so far. Humanity forfeited God's blessing through sin and rebellion, and so God chose Abraham's family as the vehicle 
through which he would restore his blessing to all the world. But the new Pharaoh does not view Israel as a blessing. He actually thinks this growing Israelite immigrant group is a threat to his power. And so just as in Genesis, humanity rebels against God's blessing, so here Pharaoh attempts to destroy the source of God's blessing, the Israelites. He brutally enslaves them in forced labor, and then he orders that all the Israelite boys be drowned in the Nile River. Now, Pharaoh, he is the worst character in the Bible so far. His kingdom epitomizes humanity's rebellion against God. Pharaoh has so redefined good and evil according to his own interests that even the murder of innocent children has become good to him. And so Egypt has become worse than Babylon from the book of Genesis. And so now Israel cries out for help against this new Babylon, and God responds. God first turns Pharaoh's evil upside down as an Israelite mother throws her boy into the Nile River, but in a basket. And so he floats safely right down into Pharaoh's own family. He's named Moses, and he grows up to eventually become the man that God will use to defeat Pharaoh's evil. In the famous story of the burning bush, God appears to Moses and commissions him to go to Pharaoh and order him to release the Israelites. And God says that he knows Pharaoh will resist, and so he will bring his judgment on Egypt in the form of plagues. Then God also says that he will harden Pharaoh's heart. And so we're introduced into the next main part of the story, the confrontation between God and Pharaoh. Now, what does this mean that God says he'll harden Pharaoh's heart? It's super important to read this section of the story really closely and in sequence. In Moses and Pharaoh's first encounter, we're told simply that Pharaoh's heart grew hard. There's no implication that God did anything. And so in response, God sends the first set of five plagues, each one confronting Pharaoh and one of his Egyptian gods. And each time, Moses offers a chance for Pharaoh to humble himself and to let the Israelites go. But after each plague, we're told that Pharaoh either hardened his heart or that his heart grew hard. He's doing this of his own will. And so eventually, it's with the second set of five plagues that we begin to hear how God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So the point of the story seems to be this. Even though God knew that Pharaoh would resist his will, God still offered him all of these chances to do the right thing. But eventually, Pharaoh's evil reaches a point of no return. I mean, even his own advisors think that he has lost his mind. And it's at that point that God takes over and bends Pharaoh's evil towards his own redemptive purposes. God lures Pharaoh into his own destruction as he saves his people, which is what happens next. With the final plague, it's the night of Passover, and God turns the tables on Pharaoh. Just as he killed the sons of the Israelites, so God will kill the firstborn in Egypt with a final plague. But unlike Pharaoh, God provides a means of escape through the blood of the lamb. And here the story stops and introduces us in detail to the annual Israelite ritual of Passover. On the night before Israel left Egypt, they sacrificed a young spotless lamb and painted its blood on the doorframe of their house. And when the divine plague came over Egypt, the houses covered with the blood of the lamb were passed over and the sun spared. And so every year since, the Israelites have reenacted that night to remember and to celebrate God's justice and his mercy. But Pharaoh, because of his pride and rebellion, he loses his own son, and he's compelled to finally let the Israelites go free. And so the Israelite slaves make their exodus from Egypt. But no sooner do they leave that Pharaoh changes his mind, and he gathers his army and chases after the Israelites for a final showdown. As the Israelites pass through the waters of the sea safely, Pharaoh charges towards his own destruction. The Exodus story concludes with the first song of praise in the Bible. It's called the Song of the Sea. And the final line declares that the Lord reigns as king. And then the song retells in poetry what the story of God's kingdom is all about. It's about how God is on a mission to confront evil in his world and to redeem those who are enslaved to evil. God is going to bring his people into the promised land where his divine presence will live among them. This story is what it looks like when God becomes king over his people. So after the Israelites sing their song, the story takes a sharp 
turn. The Israelites, they're trekking through the wilderness on their way to Mount Sinai, and they're hungry, they're thirsty, and they start criticizing Moses and God for even rescuing them. They say they long for the good old days in Egypt. I mean, it's crazy. So God graciously provides food and water for Israel in the wilderness, but these stories, they cast a dark shadow. And we begin to wonder, could it be that Israel's heart is just as hard as Pharaoh's? We shall see. But for now, that's the first half of the book of Exodus. Well, that, uh, that sort of sets the sage in the tone, huh? Yes, it does. It's always nice to see how they break it down and picture uh, how Exodus is going to roll mm. on January 22nd. On January 22nd, we turn our attention to the book of Exodus and the Word of God. All right. So Moses emerges as leader. With the death of Joseph, the Genesis record comes to an end. And some 400 years apparently pass before another scriptural account focuses back on the descendants of Israel and Egypt. In the years covered by the Genesis record, the outstanding man of God was Abraham. It was Abraham who fathered the nation, which would become God's chosen people. It was Abraham whose belief and trust in God's promises made him an example of faith for all times. And the Exodus record begins with a new spiritual leader emerges from among God's people. For a more sophisticated age, Moses will be a man of education, training, royal upbringing. He will be a, an author, lawgiver, builder, military leader. More importantly, he, like Abraham, will be a man of faith in God and an intermediary between God and his people. The story of Moses' ascension to a place of leadership over the Israelites is a fascinating one in which the provincial hand of God can be seen to lift Moses from his lowly birth as a Hebrew to a place of honor in the very household of the ruling Pharaoh. Then, during a time of exile in the land of Midian, just east of the uh, Sin Sinai Peninsula, across from the Gulf of Aquaba, Moses takes a wife by the name of Zipporah. Zipporah's father is known as both Ruel and Jethro. It is in Midian that Moses is called by God to lead the Hebrew nation out of the oppressive bondage into which they have fallen since the days of Joseph. It is clear that Moses is reluctant to take on the responsibility of leadership, and therefore God must demonstrate the power that he will be given to Moses in order to accomplish the mission which God has assigned him. It is near Mount Horeb, that also known as Mount Sinai, that God confronts Moses, and it will be on this same mountain that one of the most important events in the history of the Hebrew nation will later take place. The Exodus record now begins where the Genesis record ended with the last uh, recital of the sons of Israel to the first uh, em immigrated to, to Egypt. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each of his family, Reuben, Simon, Levi, Judah, Eskar, Zubalon, and uh, Benjamin, Dan, and Nephali, uh, Gad, and Asher, the descendants of Jacob, numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Now Joseph and his brothers and all the generations died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so no numerous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, who, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Now, it's interesting, just as a side note, we don't really know how long that was. I mean, they were, they were there for 470 years or something like that, 400 years after uh, Joseph um, had... Uh, died, but uh, when they exactly came into, into this time of, um, of being in bondage, it's, it's hotly debated. Uh, but at any rate, th this uh, Pharaoh comes into power. Look, he said to this people, the Israelites have become too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And 
if war breaks out, will join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Pithom and Ramius as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar, with all kinds of work in the fields. With their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose name was Shifra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that a baby is a boy, kill him. If it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and they give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. But, and because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born must be thrown into the Nile, but let every girl live. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine, a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a, a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch and placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the banks, bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of those Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So the women took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses saying, I drew him out of the water. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to Reuel, their father, he asked them, why have you returned so early today? They answered, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he? Rael asked the daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. So Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. Zipporah gave birth to a son and Moses named him Gershom saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. 
Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Moses, God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Go assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what you have been, what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. The elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us take a three day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord, our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward this people, so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters, and, you, and so you will plunder the Egyptians. Moses answered, What if they did not believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you? The Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground, then it became a snake, and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, the skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. Now put it back into your cloak, he said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored, just like the rest of his flesh. Then the Lord said, if they do not believe you or pay attention to the first sign, they may believe the second. But if they do not believe the second, these two signs are listen. If they do not believe the second, these two signs are listened to you. Take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, Who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? 
Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord, please send someone else. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses and he said, what about your brother, Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you and he will be glad to see, he will be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you and it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take the staff in your hand so you can perform the signs with it. Then Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, let me return to my own people in Egypt and see if any of them are still alive. Jethro said, go, and I wish you well. Now the Lord had said to Moses and Midian, go back to Egypt for all those who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey and started back to Egypt, and he took the staff of God in his hand. The Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, you will see, see that you will perform Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son, and I told you, let my son go so he may worship me. But you refused to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. But Zipporah took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. At that time, she said, bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. The Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he met Moses at the mountain of God and kissed him. Then Moses told Aaron everything the Lord had sent him to say, and also about the signs that he had commanded him to perform. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed. And when they had heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. These were the heads of the families. The sons of Reuben and the firstborn son of Israel were Hanak and Paul and Hezron and Kar Karmia, 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 how do you say her? Kar Karmi? I guess it's a son, so Karmi. <laughs> Sons of Hezron and Carmi, these were the clans of Reuben. The sons of Simeon were Jam, uh, Jemuel, okay, Todd, I, I give. Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, Zohar, and Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman. These were the clans of Simeon. These are the names of the sons of Levi, according to their records. Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. Levi lived 137 years. The sons of Gershon by clans were Libni and Shimei. The sons of Kohath were Amran, Izhar, Hebron, and Uziel. Kohath lived 133 years. The sons of Merari were Mali and Mushi. These are the clans of Levi, according to their records. Amram married his father's sister, Jehoshabel, Jehoshabed, who bore him Aaron and Moses. Amram lived 137 years. The sons of Izhar were Korah, Nepheg, and Zikri. The sons of Uziel were Mishael, Elzaphan and Sithri. Aaron married Elsheba, daughter of Amminadab and sister of Nashon, and she bore him Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. The sons of Korah were Asir, Elkanah, and Abiasaph. These were the Korathite clans. Eleazar, son of Aaron, married one of the daughters of Putiel, and she bore him Phinehas. These were the heads of the Levite families, clan by clan. It was this Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, bring the Israelites out of Egypt by their divisions. They were the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, about bringing the Israelites out of Egypt, this same Moses and Aaron. I just had an epiphany, and it's, it's not so much about the text, but about how to do this study. And that's, and that's to pick up on a lesson that Dave just taught me, that if we come up on a big pile of names, just hit mute and pretend like you can't. You, you, <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's very well played, sir. Very well played. That's uh, pretty sneaky. 
That's really good. All right. So any, any observations, Todd? And I don't know if you ever can chime back in, Dave, or not, but it doesn't sound like I hear anything from you yet. Uh, Todd, what do you, what'd you find? One of the things that was, I was intrigued by Mark really kind of early on, just as a side note, you know, with Pharaoh, and I know we'll see more about this interchange now between Moses and Pharaoh. Why didn't Pharaoh just kill him? You know, he, he, he had, he had no trouble ordering all kinds of death. Right. And, and it's just intriguing to me that, that um, he continued to have these back and forth issues with Moses. And I, I mean, I, I'm certainly, I'm glad that he didn't, but I just wonder, you know, why didn't you just execute him on the spot? Yeah, put down this rebellion, you know, but there, there must have been there must have been some something that maybe uh, we don't know about uh, Egyptian law, yeah. Egyptian custom that made, you know, something like that more difficult or right. or maybe it was just, you know, God's favor, you know, so it, it could be any number of those kinds of things, I guess, in my mind. But, you know, what was uh, what was really fun is just that re, the re, kind of the early uh, insecurity of Moses. Uh, I, I don't know if I want. I don't know if I want this job, you know. Uh, and I think there's lots of maybe real strong reasons why he probably fell into that position of, I'm not really sure that I want to lead these people. I'm not sure that I'm capable of engaging Pharaoh. By the way, God, you remember I'm still maybe uh, on, you know it's some trouble and hot water there. Uh, I don't want to go back. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of elements, but there's this reluctance uh, in his heart to engage and embrace this uh, mission that he's been called to. And I've seen that a lot with some really great leaders. In fact, I remember seeing that with you, Todd, to just, I don't know if I, I mean, there's a lot of things that I could do at this stage of my life, right? I think Moses is feeling the same way. Like, God, you know what? I'm I'm not young. I, I have, I have, I have like a life that I've carved out for myself. I've got a plan for how it's going to end. I, I have this whole thing mapped out and I don't know that I want to go do this thing for you. And, uh, and yet God taps him and says, you know what, uh, Todd, I got a job for you. I got, yeah. I got a commission for you. And I, I, I can kind of imagine that as you're even reading this, that you might be relating going, <laughs> Yeah, you better give me a better staff, God, because because <laughs> what I've discovered so far is leading these people it's, it's, miracles. You know? Yeah, yeah, I uh, I can relate to poor Moses when he's trying to lead those poor, you know, those Israelites that are so rebellious on their own, right? Oh boy, no, that's that's not true. But you know, it is interesting how 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 much he resisted and really did drag his feet. And, and I wonder if that's why God kind of got fed up, fed up with him and he decided he's just going to kill him. I, I've had, I'm, you know what? I'm just going to kill him. Yeah. Enough of this. Enough of this. <laughs> Which, you know, it, it, and Dave had mentioned this early before we actually started the study, that, that little note that I'd forgotten until that came up, you know, that as he's making his way back, that would be one of those questions as to wonder, I wonder why. Why, why, why did that happen? What was, what was, why would God want to send you to send an angel or himself? I'm going to come back. I'm going to kill him. And then she, you know, she uh, intervened. Right. Um, that, that's an intriguing part of the story too, I think. Well, I know as a father, I've not, I've not come to uh, actually taking any of my kids' lives, but you know, boy, oh boy. <laughs> <Am I? laughs> The, the whole, I brought you into this world. That that feeling's real. <laughs> Going to take you out. Yeah. All right. Questions. Uh, how do you think Pharaoh's fear maybe led him to make some of these bad decisions? So you got the Israelite people, right? They're they're increasing in number. They're everywhere. Uh, somewhere along the line, they got some sort of favor in the land, and uh, and now they're, you know. They're everywhere, and we we don't want them. It, it's a threat. If we were invaded, I mean, this is what he said. I mean, the text alludes that if we were invaded, we have no reason to assume that they're going to side with us. 
and we might have an insurrection from within that we won't be able to deal with. We've got to we got to deal with this now, and uh, and so that paranoia and 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 anger brought them to a place of of uh, you know bringing them into slavery. If that's seems to be the story, right? Well, and and you wonder too. Um, you know, I think you're right. I mean, I think you know his his insecurity obviously really came through. He didn't have the confidence that what whatever was going on with the Israelites, that the Egyptian people would somehow not be able to, you know, maintain control of whatever their, you know, whatever their authority was, so, so to speak. Um, but yeah, look at what happened when, because of that insecurity, not, not only does he end up eventually having to let them go, but destroys his people in the process. Right. I mean, death of the firstborn and the plagues and, and all these things that happened simply because he was insecure. And so, again, that's part of the reason why the, the 400 years of slavery is somewhat debated. It's like you've got Abraham and his family that, that kind of reside, they land. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, we're some distance down the road, and there's Israelites so numerous that it's creating anxiety for Pharaoh to say, what do we do with all these people? And uh, puts them into slave labor. Uh, and there's, you know, incredible things that get built as a result of that. You know, so uh, th that, whole, that whole thing seems to indicate that was some... 100, 150 years into their being in the land. Now, how long did they thought think that they were going to stay uh, when they when they first showed up? Seven, seven days? Or for a seven while. Days? They were going to gonna stay for a little while. Well, they were yeah, going to stay for a while until the, until the, until the you know, famine was done and uh, they could go, <laughs> go back. We're, we're taking up residency for a short time, which... Well, let's wait until dad dies and, and well, let's hang on a little bit because this is really nice here. You know, why would we go carve out a new life somewhere else when we've got it so well? And, uh, and then a generation passes and another generation and, uh, and now who was, who was your dad? Why would, what was your, what would, why would we show favor to you guys? You know, and it right. nothing to us anymore. Right. And so the story of Joseph uh, is has lost any meaning in the land, and all we see are this immigrant people group that's taking over, and let's run them out. So, pretty amazing. So you know, Mark, and I know we haven't got done much with the question with the questions, but so Joseph Joseph was really that link between those two nations. It doesn't sound as though they had infused any of the other Israelites into any kind of leadership positions. And it wasn't like they groomed someone. You know, Joseph was the only connecting point, right? Correct. And, uh, and he, was, uh, he was such a powerful influence and figure and had been so for, for Pharaoh at that time where, you know, interpreting the dreams and all of that uh, gave him favor, gave him land. He managed the, the, the task at hand in such a masterful way that uh, continued to afford them incredible riches, wealth, and opportunity. And yet, in, in, a, in a very interesting way, I mean, here, God, it says, you know, God, you know, grew them in this place and was fulfilling the promise of being a blessing into the nations. And so it's not like you know, God's plan was at all thwarted by them being there. It just makes you wonder, uh, could you have avoided that? And at the same time, how perfect it was to see all of these elements come into place in the grand scheme of history and God's redemptive plan. It feels almost as if, you know, this was necessary. And, uh, or maybe if it wasn't necessary, boy, does God really use what seems like horrible circumstances for the benefit of history? For the not maybe just the benefit of of a moment or a person or a people, but of of the history of God's redemptive work on on humanity. So right. uh, it's a, it's pretty remarkable the way the text unfolds. What would you say your opinion? Is, uh, your opinion if an authority told you to do something within the law, but against God's law? 
Well, that's a that's a tough one, isn't it? I think you know, but in, in my nature, I you know I of course not knowing exactly what it was, but in my nature, I might be inclined to say no. I I need to leave this position. I I don't think I I can't. I'm sorry, I can't do that. I, I can't work here. I think I would resign. Mm -hmm. Depending on what it was, I, it's. Uh, and I can't think of a good example of what you know what that might be off the top of my head, but I feel like I feel like I would probably say no. I, I this just doesn't feel right for me anymore. I think I got to go. It, it it strikes me that I know that um, we're we're super close in uh, this season <laughs> to having a few examples of of where government was imposing itself on the church and uh and saying we want you to we want you because of what we believe are our moral reasons because of what we think are our wise reasons we want you to uh neglect to do what god has called you to do and uh and churches all over the place said you know uh in some well they made, they made a number of different choices some churches said we're not going to do it because of what you're saying, but we also see some wisdom and some morality in making a decision. So not because of what you're saying, but because of wisdom and morality, we're going to choose to uh, follow the, the edict, but it, we're not following the edict for the edict's sake. We're following the edict for the wisdom and the safety of the culture and the love of our neighbor's sake. Uh, and so you may call it a law. We would call it a voluntary uh, participation. Then there were some churches that said, uh, "He double hockey sticks." No, we're not going to do that. You know, we want to we want to live uh, our lives free from the imposition of government and your in, uh, unbiblical stance towards our collective meetings. And uh, and they brought that to the Supreme Court and and won. And uh, and so in the places where it went to court, uh, the courts have sided with the church that the government cannot make laws against religious services so in this one sliver of time uh it appears as if our constitutional uh rights and authorities have uh have continued to hold true for the church which bodes well for our immediate future but it sure brings uh a clarity about how quickly things can change and how uh fragile uh freedom and biblical biblical freedom, theological freedom, uh, living our lives in, in free prosperity, uh, apart from government influence, how quickly that can all change. And so we, uh, we shall uh, always be at risk, but we should never take for granted what freedoms have been afforded us in our country and what are still afforded to us today. All right. right. Time, believe it or not. So uh, let's uh, let's pray it out. Uh, Todd, why don't you pray us out today? Dave, are you back for with? Wolf? I think I am. I'm not Dave? sure. I, I I signed myself out and I signed myself back in. So honestly, we carried a lot of weight for you today. You pray us out. It's, you, <laughs> <laughs> bring us home, Dave. I will do that gladly. Thank you, Lord. You uh, you have shown us things in the scriptures that so many times we did not even know we were there before. And Father, I thank you that you have given us the assurance that because of Jesus Christ, we are yours and we are your people. Um, but we also carry a heritage that comes to us from Israel. And the things that we learned from Exodus, the things that we learned from jo Moses, and the life of Moses, uh, they have so much to say to us. So Father, I would ask your blessing on everyone that was in the meeting. And Father, we give you thanks for the leadership you have given to us. I thank you for Pastor Mark. I thank you for his uh, wisdom. And I thank you for Pastor Todd. And Father, we just give you thanks for all things and uh, in this, we give you your your honor due and uh, give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Gang, make it a great day. And uh, we'll hopefully see you back here tomorrow for Exodus Part 2. See you guys. 
I'm I'm sorry, everyone. I, I'm sorry I messed th th this messed up for you. I, it was a providential thing because you got all the names. <laughs> well, we will give you another. Dave will give you a chance to redeem yourself, for, to be sure. I'll right. be back on Sunday. <laughs> See you guys.